morning, everyone, and welcome. My name is Maria Tranquilli, and I'm a program manager at the NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center. For those of you who may not know, the NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center is a nonprofit dedicated to enabling entrepreneurs from all over the world to realize their maximum potentials and grow. We will open up for live Q&A at the end of this event. Please submit your questions in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen throughout this presentation. And none of what we do could be possible without the amazing support from our sponsors. We are humbled by their contributions. During these unique times, we are curious about how sentiment is among the entrepreneurs in our community. We would like to start by taking a few polls that will let us know how you're feeling about your business right now. Our first poll, how are you currently feeling? Please let us know here. Are you feeling fearful, anxious? Are you surviving? Are you optimistic? Thank you, everyone. It looks like optimistic is at 52%. That's exciting. Poll number two, what type of entrepreneur are you? Are you an entrepreneur that's currently in business? Are you an aspiring entrepreneur? Or perhaps you have another position in your company? We have lots of entrepreneurs in business with us today. And finally, what is keeping you up at night? Is it finance, sales, or marketing? Is it scaling, pivoting, your team, or something else? Please let us know. Wonderful, thank you all for contributing. It looks like sales and finance are at the top for today as what is keeping us up at night. Without further delay, please join me in giving a warm welcome to our author in residence, Stu Hynek, author of How to Get a Meeting with Anyone. Stu, thank you so much for joining us today. It's a pleasure to be with you. Pleasure to be with you. I don't know if you can see me, but I'm, I'm here. Let's see, let's try to get your video started. That would Perfect. help. There you are. <laughs> there we Hi, go. <laughs> thank you so much for joining us today and I hand it to you. It's a pleasure to join you. Um, can we, I, so we're, we're going to be talking about getting meetings. It's such a critical mission for, for everybody in business, business, but I think probably most critical for startup entrepreneurs. And so I want to share really quickly a video with you. You know, I, I, I'm involved with a lot of campaigns to help clients uh, get meetings. And so I want to show you what happens when, um, when one of those meetings, when, when some, one of these pieces shows up. So we'll take a look at that. I usually wait till you get here, Bill, to show your packages, but this one's pretty cool and I'm too anxious to wait and show you. So, here's the reveal. If I can get the cap off. Read how awesome this is. The Tale of the Hired Gun. I ever tell you, Phil, is the story of the Billy Kid? Yep, sure did. How about Wild Bill Jean? You mean the marketing whiz from San Diego? At least a hundred times before. Yep, you can say that again. <laughs> Look at the back. I'm kind of in love with this guy. Mad respect. Well, that is the moment we're trying to, we're shooting to create in all of these contact campaigns. I call it flip moment. So it's, it's when the recipient, because we're, we're interrupting them. It's when the recipient goes from, who's this? And I'm like, wow, who's it? Who's interrupting me to, oh my God, wow, who is this? And, and we, I never get to see that. So I'm so excited about that video. Finally, someone recorded their, um, their, their reaction to it. Um, and so I just think that that's, that, that is the thing, that's, that's our, that's the brass ring. That's what we're re reaching for when we're trying to reach important people. And if you think about it, think about the, the importance of meetings. I mean, every big thing that ever happens in our lives happens because we make connections with the right people. I mean, the, 
make, we, we connect with the right people at the right time. And really without meetings, nothing happens. I mean, I guess we all know this, but I think that startup entrepreneurs have the biggest challenge of all because, you know, you're at, I'm going to assume a lot, but I'm going to assume that you're, you're reaching out to angel investors and VCs and um, recruits and uh, possible uh, partner, strategic partners, and you're recruiting your team. Everything has to happen pretty quickly. And that all happens as a result of having meetings. So it's really a sink or swim situation much more than, I mean, I, I speak to, uh, to sales teams and sales reps a lot about this, but I think more than, more than their reality, I think yours is you need meetings and you need the right ones and you need to get them pretty quickly. Well, I want to share with you my story of how I got started. You saw the cartoon and I think that might be a little bewildering, but I'm, I'm one of the Wall Street Journal cartoonists and I also uh, am an author. I, I wrote um, a couple of books. I'll show them in a second. But the way that I got started with getting meetings and cartoons, well, where, where, where does all this come from? Well, this came from very, very well, when I was starting my career, I wanted to create direct mail campaigns for the big magazine publishers. And, um, and what I wanted to do was marry cartooning with personalization. So I, and in fact, if you've ever gotten any of these mailings from, from publishers from years ago that have a cartoon and it's about you on the, on the face of the envelope, that's from me. That's, that's from these campaigns that resulted from all this. But I had to get there. You know, I did, I did, it just didn't happen out of the blue, obviously. You're entrepreneurs, you know that none of this happens out of the blue. But I had to reach the right people. And so it started with, I got in touch with the right person, the right people at Bon Appetit and Rolling Stone. Those, those were my first two clients. Um, and both of the test campaigns that we did together, that I created for them, beat their controls, which means that they set new records for response. That's amazing. I was a, I was a rookie. It was like walking onto the field and, and in the major leagues and hitting two grand slam home runs. I knew that was my opening, but still I needed to get in touch with the right people. And I knew that was about, let's say two dozen VPs and directors of circulation at the big Manhattan based media companies, you know, like Time Inc, um, Condé Nast, uh, the Wall Street Journal, Forbes, uh, Harvard Business Review, although they're not in Manhattan, but the big publishers. And I needed to reach these people that are, are really highly placed and they're not easy to reach. But that, well, okay, I, of course I need to reach them. So I put together this little campaign, didn't know what to call it. So I called it a contact campaign. And my campaign consisted of an eight by 10 print with, um, you know, with the, of, of a cartoon with the recipient's name in the caption. So it's about them and a note that said, you know, uh, I'm, I, hi, I'm Stu, and I. this is the device I just used to beat the controls for Rolling Stone and Bon Appetit, and I'd like to put this to the test for your titles. We should talk. And if we were talking live, I, it, I'm, I, I wish we were, but we're not. If we were all together live in a room, I'd ask you, what do you think I got for a response? Because, you know, let's say, let's preface this a little bit. In direct response, we were always told that if you get a 1% response rate, you're doing really well. That's kind of a typical response rate, they used to say, although I don't think there is any such number. There's no, no typical number, but let's use that for a moment, a 1% response rate. And then if you think about digital marketing, I mean, click-through rates can be thousands of a percent or at least hundreds of a percent. So those are really low numbers. I mean, that's, I guess, what we expect from marketing, but not from contact marketing um, and from contact campaigns. I got 100% response rate. I got through to all of them. All of them met with me. All of them actually then became clients. So it was not only 100% response rate to this campaign, but also 100% conversion on the back end. It was worth millions of dollars to me, and it stemmed from a campaign that I spent $100 on. So I hope that from my talk with you, this brief talk with you, and brief time that we're going to have together, that I can help inspire you to do some of the same things, having those some of those same results from getting critical meetings to happen. I know you already know that those need to happen, but I hope that I can help you with, uh, with getting those things to happen more readily. Now, I usually, you know, I usually talk to, um, I usually talk to audiences of sales reps, but, um, you know, and there's lots of stories that are really relevant to them, but I, I wanted to share two stories with you that are uh, of, of, startups and how they used contact marketing 
to create an enormous jump in scale. So one of them was a company called Aurabrush. So um, that the dentist in, in Utah developed this tongue cleaner and it's called it, he called it the, um, the, or, the Aura Brush, and he wanted it to be the best selling tongue cleaner in the world. <clears throat> so he hired an ex Procter & Gamble marketer as his CEO, and then they hired a team of young guys from college who were very, very good at making videos. And that became their market, or they became their marketing department. And they said, you know what, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna make videos, um, kind of off, kind of cheeky videos, but videos, um, we'll, we'll run them on YouTube, and that will draw uh, business to, a, to an e-commerce site, and we'll sell that way. We'll just sell directly to consumers, and that worked out really well. They ended up selling about a million dollars worth of product in the first year. Pretty cool, but you know, people always want to go a little further, right? Or else they're not really entrepreneurs. So they wanted to go further, and they felt that their next play was let's go, let's go into the, uh, let's break into brick and mortar um, retail. Let's let's get into Walmart. I mean, like. Don't, don't shoot small or low, let's aim high. So Walmart was their target and they went through the process of registering as a, as a possible vendor. And um, as you can imagine, it's just kind of a dead end crowded channel. Crowded channels suck. We don't, we don't want to waste time in crowded channels. And so um, they, and they, they certainly discovered that, but the young guys, they were impatient. And so they decided <laughs> unbeknownst to the founder, that they would put together a quick little ad that they run on Facebook, a little tiny ad, I don't know, like that big, really tiny thing. And the ad said, um, Walmart employees have bad breath. And it was targeted to the Bentonville, Arkansas zip code where, where their headquarters are. And, um, <laughs> and, and, you know, college education had to have at least college or, or, um, or an advanced degree had to be 35, 30 to 45 years of age. In essence, they were targeting the, the, um, the, the right buyer at Walmart. And within 48 hours, they heard from them, not what they were expecting to hear, because instead what they, <laughs> they heard from the communications, I might've been the legal department, but it was pretty much, I'm pretty sure it was the communications department. And they were saying, are you the people behind this ad? Yeah, well, well please take it down. And they were so panicked and they said, you know, was this thing running? And they're of course saying, of course, we'll take it down. But was this thing running nationally? Is that what was happening? You were telling everybody we have bad breath? No, 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 no. We targeted just you folks just in the headquarters because we want to sell, we want to sell our, our product to you. And they said, well, gosh, you guys are really pretty, pretty, um, pretty knowledgeable digital marketers. That's pretty cool. You know what? Well, next thing you know, they're introduced to the dental products buyer who says, Great. Hey, listen. Can you uh, can you support an an order for seven hundred thirty five thousand units? That was a one one and a half million dollar order. That was one and a half times their previous year's production. That was a nice order, <laughs> already a nice outcome from one meeting. But it got better because when I interviewed the the CEO of of Aurabrush, um, I asked them, well, you know, if you have this, you're a startup. You've been around for a year. You've got some good sales. I mean, that's healthy sales. But now all of a sudden you're being rolled out in 6,800 stores in the Walmart network and you're, you're being rolled out in Walmart for God's sake. That's, a, that's an incredible outcome. What do you suppose that did to the valuation of the company? And he said, I'm pretty sure it was at least a 10X jump in value. He, he figured that, that, was, that the, the, the business was worth 2 million, two times, uh, two times sales was his figure um, and that it jumped 10x, so it went from 2 million to 20 million. So they got a $1.5 million order and a jump from 2 million to, to 20 million in valuation from one ad that ran for 48 hours and cost them 28 bucks. That's really, I won't say that's a typical, um, it's not a typical outcome. I mean, that's a 69,500,000% ROI on that, on that ad, but it is very typical of contact marketing in another sense, which is that you don't really have to spend a lot of money to, for these outreaches. And when you're connecting with the right people, jumps at scale can, can happen. And that's, that's a pretty dramatic jump in scale. Well, there's another story that I wanna share with you um, about the No Wait app. Now the No Wait app was developed a while ago now. Uh, it was developed to help restaurants. Um, they, they all have those, those your table is ready pucks that vibrate when your table's ready. 
But what they wanted to do was just use an app to turn everybody's smartphone into a, into a, a, a puck. And but because it's an app and, and it's on their phone, they can, they can check in before they even leave their homes and, and register for or sign in for a table. So perhaps while they're, while they're arriving or perhaps while they're shopping, they don't have to wait around is the point. The, the no wait app would allow people who want a table um, to be notified by the restaurant when the table's ready. That's pretty cool. So they, here's their target though. They decided what they wanted to do was they wanted to penetrate the top 30 restaurant chains in America that seated their guests. Obviously McDonald's wouldn't work. Nobody gets a puck at McDonald's. You stand there in line. But of the, of the big chains that seat their, 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 their patrons, they wanted to get, they wanted to get as much of these of, of those, uh, uh, as possible. So they put together a really clever campaign. And what it, what it was, was um, a, a set of personalized videos that were loaded, each loaded onto a, uh, an iPad. And the video had three segments. Then the first segment, and let's say, for example, maybe this, this one's going, they're, they're approaching Red Robin. So in their approach to Red Robin, in that first segment of the video, there's a man on the street with a hidden camera, sort of lapel camera, and that's the scene. And he's walking up to to Red Robin and it's a busy Saturday night and you can see lots of people and then you go into the restaurant, oh my God, it's just stuffed full of people. And they make their way to the, to the host table or, or uh, captain's, um, the, 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 uh, the captain's uh, podium, whatever, <laughs> I've forgotten what it's called. But anyway, where you, where you sign up for your table and saying, well, you know, table for four, how long will that take? That'll take an hour. Oh my God, really? Yeah, but you can wait over there. And they point to this, Oh, over there. And they point to this, you know, we've, we've seen them, these, these bars where nobody, nobody was going there for the bar, but that's where they stuff everybody who's waiting for tables. So everybody's standing around or sitting around uncomfortably sipping a drink when they really wanted to just sit down and eat. And so they went in, again, the, 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 the segment continued and they're asking people in the, in the restaurant, just, you know, what, how long did they say your wait would be? Oh God, an hour. What do you, how do you feel about that? Oh, I hate it, obviously, right? And nobody likes that. Um, so then the next segment comes in, and that's a really slick uh, segment that explains what the No Aid app is, what it does, how it helps restaurants, and how it will disrupt the industry. And then finally, the final app, or the final uh, segment is the CEO of No Wait looking into the camera, talking to the CEO. I think his name was Paul Murphy, the CEO of Red Robin, and he's saying, "Hey, Paul." I love eating at your restaurants. I love Red Robin, but I don't, I hate waiting for a table. And as you saw, everybody hates waiting for a table. We really need to talk. So when my rep comes calling, I want you to, I want you to answer his call and I want you to meet with him. Well, that campaign generate, well, 80%, 80% response to that campaign. That's fantastic. Um, and in fact, some of, some of the CEOs responded back saying, this is the best campaign I've ever seen. That's important. Because remember, we want to create those flip moments. If they're saying this is the best campaign that they've ever seen, they're going to even share it. You could actually get a response rate that goes beyond 100%, actually. But still, 80% to a marketing campaign is remarkable. And they also ended up with a 66%. So two thirds of the, or 20 out of the top 30 restaurant chains in America from that one campaign to 30 people became clients. So it was a 66% almost instant market penetration from a contact campaign to 30 people. That's pretty cool. I think that's, that's what gets me so excited about contact marketing. So really what is contact marketing? Well, the definition sort of goes like this. It's they're micro focused campaigns that are designed to create contact with VIP clients or contacts. And the metrics of contact marketing are remarkable. We've been talking about it. Um, response rates that, you know, I won't say typically, but, but fairly routinely go to, uh, to at 100% or just, just about 100%. That's amazing. I, I don't know of any other form of marketing that does that. Um, and the record for for response to these campaigns is 300%. So somebody was getting this campaign and they were showing it around and, and the people they were showing it around to were responding as well. That's, what, that's how you get a, a response rate above 100%. I mean, like we wouldn't even imagine that that's possible. 
in, in direct response, they always used to say that 100% response rates are impossible. And then on the ROI side of the metrics, we see, um, we, we, we typically see tens to, ten to, tens to hundreds of thousands of uh, percent ROI. But as you just heard, the, the record, the, the highest I know of is the Aura Brush campaign, which was a 69,500,000% ROI. That's a, I'm like, I can't even understand that number. Well, I understand it by, by saying it's a $28 investment that created a $20 million return. That's just, that's contact marketing. So you might be wondering, okay, great. So how do I use contact marketing? What do I do? And well, the first thing you want to do is, of course, identify the people you want to connect with. I think you do that naturally or you wouldn't be entrepreneurs. But the thing I would say is I, 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 would, I would highly recommend that you, if you haven't already, I would imagine you're pretty well organized as well. But if you haven't put together a list of your top 100 um, contacts, then you need to put together that, that list of, 100, of your top 100. And I know that I imagine that you're selling all that, that across the audience, there are all kinds of things being developed and sold and developed for market and sold. But if it's a tech product, if it's a SaaS product, um, there's some really, I guess I'm just going to tell you, there's some really interesting tools out there. One of those is Ensable.ai. And what Ensable does is it listens to, they've trained it to listen to, um, to signs that a buyer is about to buy, about to, about to make a tech purchase. So if you sign up for their service, you can actually, you can, they'll tell you who's, who's making the signals, who is making the noises that indicate they're about to, make a, about to make a purchase. Those people ought to be put on your list. At least the right people ought to be put on your list. Timing is, timing is pretty important. Another, another couple of tools that I really, really like uh, are Seamless.ai and Nimble. Both of those allow you to take a list of people and, um, and do a profile scrape. Uh, you know, you 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 can go to their profiles and scrape it if you want, but but Seamless will do this, and it sort of works like a search engine. I guess actually Nimble does this as well, but they it'll go out and it'll just comb the web and it'll find things like uh, email addresses and telephone numbers and um, things that they like, things that they're talking about. Um, if they're in the if they're in the news, it'll find that. So that those are really really helpful things, and and in fact Nimble goes a step further and and create sort of a, a layer of CRM across this. So really it's a, it's a CRM program for, for, um, for social media activity, but, but it finds the, the, those pertinent details that you need. If you're gonna reach out to someone, you need to, reach, you need to know where to reach out to or where to send something. Um, so that's really useful. Another one that's really, really fascinating is Crystal Nose. So crystalnose.com. And that uses what they call personality AI to create a, a dossier on some, well, no, it's not even a dossier. It's a personality profile. Someone did it for me and I read it and I'm just, oh my God, that's just amazing because it talks about what motivates you or what motivates the person in the study, but what motivates them, um, how tolerant they are of risk perhaps, or the kinds of things that excite them. And, and you can use all of that in your campaign. And so then, so, okay, so that's, that's how we might identify that top one, identify and really come to understand a little bit about each of the, the people on that top 100 list, but then what might you do? And I think this might be, maybe this is one of the most helpful parts of the, of the presentation because um, I'm gonna show you some ideas. I wanna share some ideas with you. I mean, you could run Facebook ads or send, send iPads around, but people have used all kinds of things. They, they've used visual metaphors and interviews and gifts and round tables and um, they use AI and ads, full page ads in the Wall Street Journal as a, as a contact letter. And there are, people have done the most audacious and crazy things to get meetings. Um, but one of the things that I think would be really easy for you to do, really simple, you don't have to create a campaign, you don't need anybody's outside help, is to use something that I call deep personalization. In fact, you know, I mentioned my two books, I should grab them right now. You can see them on the wall behind me, but I, it's get a, how to get a meeting with anyone. By the way, this one was just named one of the top 64 sales books of all time. I'm amazed. That's crazy. Anyway, how to get a meeting with anyone. And then the other one that competes or completes the, the, the pair is get the meeting. And in get the meeting, I wrote a 
chapter about about personalization because when I started out, I you know I, I was explaining I, I used um, personalization with cartoons, so it was cartoons that were the, the captions had data insertion points for first and last names, so it was a personalized cartoon. Well, all we needed for that form of, of of personalization was just the correct spelling of your name and then an address to send it to. Um, and then we could apply, I mean, you could get a list, obviously. You can get mailing lists, you can get millions of people. You can just apply that personalization very broadly across that entire list. That's what we used to do. I mean, when, when my mailings went out for Forbes, they'd mail out 2 million at a time. And, <coughs> pardon me, and so, um, so that's, I call that wide personalization, but there's another form that's been coming to fore and that, that's deep personalization. That, that comes as a result of people having profiles and using, um, really just using the internet, but using uh, social media that we all have profiles, we have pictures up, we, have, we, 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 we say where we went to school, all these things. It's really easy to learn about us. And so people have been using deep personalization and I guess that combining that with gift giving to, um, to, to great, great effect. I'm gonna just take, check the time. We don't, I don't have time to tell the story, but deep personalization can work really well. You can use visual metaphors. I told you about, or I didn't tell you, Dan Waldschmidt sends swords to people. It's a thousand bucks. He spends a thousand bucks having this sword made up for CEOs of companies that are in trouble. He's a turnaround specialist. And when he sends this sword and this handwritten note, he gets a hundred percent response rate to his campaign. That's pretty amazing, but you don't have to spend a thousand dollars per per piece like he does. Here's a cool one. Oh, let me just get it right. Here's a coffee, a fake coffee spill. It's, this come, there's a whole industry of fake food that feeds. Uh, I don't know. If feeds is maybe not the right word, but but serves the the deli and restaurant industry. And so they have a lot of fake food, really ultra realistic fake food, and this makes a really cool drop off piece. That that's one of my clients' drop off pieces. And you can imagine sending that with a with a, a Starbucks gift card and a note just saying, hey, I, I'd just like to share a cup of coffee with you on Zoom. I mean, that would be a great way to invite someone. Or if if you if you want to use someone's um, someone's I just got to grab the right thing here, someone's profile picture, here's kind of an interesting thing you can do with their profile picture, let's say from uh, from LinkedIn. You can you can process that. There's someone's profile picture, and I processed it with a filter in Photoshop to turn it into engrave, an engraved um, piece of art, kind of like what you see in the Wall Street Journal. And in fact, even more like what you look, see in the Wall Street Journal, here it is turned into a card, a story all about meeting the, the sender whose identity is on the back. These, these combine a couple of things that are really quite prevalent in the most successful contact campaigns that I've seen in my, in my research. One of those is you gotta send something of personal value, relevance. Um, either emotional or intelligent and intelligence uh, value. Um, and then handwritten notes turn out to be a really, really important part of a lot of the most effective campaigns that I've found in my research. So here's another, another form of this, which is kind of fun. Um, these are, this is a card that has one of my go-to cartoons. So whenever someone is not returning my phone call, I always use this cartoon, so I'm going to put it way up. It's kind of hard to see it. Anyway, it's a guy at a gas station, maybe route, maybe on Route 66 somewhere out in the desert, and he's at a payphone. And Maria, if I was trying to reach you and you weren't calling me back, it, the caption would read, hi, Maria. So we get here again. He's at the payphone, stuck out in the desert, desert, and he's saying, hi, Maria, it's me again. Listen, <clears throat> I don't know if you've been checking your voicemail all last week, but I'm still here at the same number waiting for your call. And so, you know, the thing that's really cool about this is that that's so disarming. That's a great and very disarming way of saying, hey, you're hanging me up, call me back, right? So that's a pretty cool thing. Um, and you know, it's a card, you can put your identity on the back, you can put a handwritten note, it has all of those elements of, of what actually turns out to be a pretty successful campaign. And I'll show you one more, this is one of my favorites. Um, that, that I send this one when, um, when, when I, I have a proposal that has stalled and you know, God, that happens to all of us, right? So um, after a while, you leave, you, you can only leave so many messages. I mean, it's good to be persistent, but you'll, you'll feel rather silly leaving a lot of messages after a while. So at least I do. And eventually I just end up saying, okay, I'm going to send him this, this cartoon. 
So this one has this guy, you can see him, he's cradling the phone on his shoulder and he's rifling through some papers on his desk and he's saying, hey, listen, uh, we got your proposal and we like everything except having to pay you. And I put in that, I sent that one out with a note saying, hey, sorry, it didn't work out this time, maybe next time. And it's kind of like dragging a string around the corner from a cat. They, they're saying, whoa, 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 wait a minute, hold on a second. I mean, like at least 50% of the time, they're saying, oh, wait, hold on, I didn't mean to ignore you. That, that's, listen, let's get, let's get it going right now. So it, it resurrects these, um, these stalled proposals. It's a great, these are great, they're great tools. They're great, uh, very disarming tools for, uh, you know, for, for, for breaking through in, in situations where it's hard to break through. And really, they're very much akin to getting meetings. They're very much um, uh, related to it. Maria, we're, we're ready for, um, for questions and answers. But the one thing I wanted to say is I have a gift that I want to give anybody who's interested. I just sh showed this card. Let me pick it up again. This guy, the, the one that gets people to, to return your phone call. So I have a, a, a system of uh, editable PDFs and I'm, and, and you know, so it, it creates this and there are logos on the back and all that. So if anyone is interested, I'm happy to make one of those for you. So it would be a, an editable PDF. I'll set it up with your identity on the back and your logo and so forth. And it'll be an editable PDF and you just sort of send as many as you want. Dude, that is an incredible gift to offer this community. Oh my goodness. So if anyone wants to take Stu up on this offer, uh, where and how should they do that, Stu? Well, I think the easiest way to do that would be just come to my author site. Well, well you can connect with me on LinkedIn too. I would encourage you to do that, but then you can send me a DM that way. But Or, or come to my author site. Um, you can get a sneak preview into the in, into get the meeting, the, the, the newer one. This one just came out in October. So you can get a sneak preview there, but also if you just use the contact us link, it'll come to me and just mention that you saw me on, on, on this learning and, um, and you want the, the card and I'm happy to accommodate. So generous. So we'll make sure that we actually put Stu's LinkedIn and, um, and uh, I'm sorry, website address in the chat today so everyone can find him. And it will also be in the uh, resource email that we send following this webinar up, which is great. So Stu, we have lots and lots of questions and we actually have some hand Good. raises, which means someone, uh, some people would like to share their voice live, which is really exciting. So let's go down this list if you're ready. And from Fred McMurray? Uh, that's, okay. Fred McMurray is a, well, a movie star. <laughs> not the same one, I'm sure. <laughs> All right, so Coffee Cup Company. Can you share the name of the company that, that um, made the coffee cup that you shared? Nope. All right. Uh, no. <laughs> Actually, I can't think of the thing. Well, I'll, I'll, it, I can't because I can't remember, but, but um, I'll tell you what, it, i tell you how to find it. So what we did was we combined two things. This was a, this was a custom order of paper cups. You can just do a Google search to do, to find that. And then, um, and then the spill itself. So we, we had the cups made up and then we sent it to, um, to the company. I, I can't, I might remember it while we're, while we're talking, but again, just Google fake foods. Um, and you're, what you're looking for are spills. And they've got all kinds of spills. I mean, Dr. Pepper and martinis and ketchup and so on. But my fa oh, actually, I don't know if you can see it behind me there. Mm, this, on this side, do you see the, there's a, anyway, there's a, there's a, an ice cream cone that's spilled. They've got all kinds of really cool things. And the ice cream cone, by the way, is another great visual metaphor. I love food as a visual, as a visual metaphor. Actually, so I'm sorry I don't have those those names to give you um, directly, but if you do a couple of Google searches, you'll find them. And I'm sure we have some researchers in this community that are typing right now. So if anyone comes across that, please share that in the chat. Yeah. Um, okay, we have a question from Sharon. How about cultural differences and the impact on effectiveness of some of these various campaigns? What works where? Any country cultures to be aware of? Ooh. Well, that is an incredible question, um, and I. And, and, oh my God, <laughs> well, I will say that, you know, history is fraught with all kinds of really wonderful blooper stories <laughs> of, you know, people who've assumed something because that's how it's done in their culture. And then, um, and then they discover that something has gone wrong. I mean, car names are really well known. I, you know, the, the Chevy Nova in Puerto Rico, I think it was, where Nova means no go, was probably not a good name <laughs> for, the, for the car. Um, 
So I think that you could probably, I think you could easily end up doing that um, in something written. You might easily do that with, with a cartoon. Although, I don't even know if I, did I explain? I don't even know if I did this, but I'm also one of the Wall Street Journal cartoonists. So I've, I have, I'm and founder of cartoonists.org. It's a group of cartoonists that um, donate, we donate our art to help charities raise funds. Uh, and, and so I'm really deeply involved in the cartooning world. Um, and I know that, that cartooning itself is, is something that's, that's just seen across cultures. So it's, I mean, the, the, the gags are gonna be different and the cultural references will be different, but it's something that, it, that actually just exists all over the world. Um, and I would say that if you, and I'm gonna just switch to let's say, um, let's say using a deep, deep personalization. If you're doing a profile scrape <clears throat> and, you and you discover that someone is really interested in, I don't know what, <clears throat> falconry, let's say, um, and you send them a, a, a falconry glove, um, you, you're going to have an amazing, uh, an amazing response to that, no matter what the, the cultural differences are. And I'll also say this, that, that um, how to get a meeting with anyone is already in print in Russia, China, and, and Vietnam, as well as in English. So, I, you know, people are using it all over the world. I know it works, and I know that your question is really, really right on the money too. You, knew, you would need to be careful about making cultural references. So I would check them. I would check with someone who's local to each of those cultures you're sending to. That's beautiful, Stu. And I, I just want to add what I, what I heard in what your, in, in your response was maybe choosing something that is um, globally relevant as opposed to culturally relevant as well. Knowing something like cartoons can actually bridge cultures, maybe similar to music. So, um, yeah, yeah, and the falconry glove, or you know, uh, um, it could be an apron because someone's really, really loves barbecuing. I don't, whatever it is that they love. I mean, in, in, if you're using deep personalization and sending a gift based on that, that's a pretty safe bet, I think. Thank you, Stu. And that actually leads into another very specific question from Marcia: Are these are these cards with cartoons available online somewhere for personalization? Oh, Marcia, it's going to sound like I paid you to ask me that, but that's, thank you. <laughs> well, yeah, there, so I have this program called Bottomless Box. That's what that card is part of. And so you can go to sales.bottomless-box.com and you'll find a, a sales page where you can join, the, where you can join um, uh, a bottomless box. So again, that's sales.bottomless-box.com. Thank you, Stu. So we'll ask one, uh, one question here from the chat. We have many others and then we'll move into maybe a live question. So whoever has their hand raised, we're happy to take that. Um, so a question from P Prakash. How do you translate or how would you translate this into the digital world, social media and email campaigns without conflicting with FTC marketing guidelines? Mm. <sighs> well, I will say this. Um, I'm not a fan of, of crowded channels to begin with. So this question reminds me a lot of a question that I get um, from sales reps, which is, how do I make my, my emails stand out? And, and I'm usually telling them, if you really would like to stand out, then I would at least advise you to be multi, uh, multi-dimensional or, or multimodal in your communication. So don't just send emails. And, and I would say, don't just do digital. I mean, if you could, I'm gonna show you a really, I, I mentioned Dan Waldschmidt that he sends swords. And, and here's the sword that he sends. Here's one of them. And so, you know, that's just, that just has so much more impact than an email. You know? and, and I think, I, I, I think I'm just, well, I'm a fan of, of just being, of being, um, of being multimodal in the ways that I communicate with people. And, and so if you're only doing, doing it digitally, uh, I think you're missing, um, you're missing an important, part of the opportunity to connect. Mm -hmm. Having said that, um, I would, you know, one of the things that, one of the things that I included in the new book and, and get the meeting also was something called pocket campaigns. I just didn't think I'd have time to, to talk about it, but here's an example of a, of a pocket campaign. So you've probably all seen this business card. It's totally internet famous. It's Kevin Mitnick's card. He's a, he's a, um, he's an IT uh, security, I don't know what to call you. He was, a, he was an ex-con, 
he went to, to prison because he was a, a hacker, one of the first ones ever to go to prison for that. But when he came out, he reinvented himself and changed, uh, changed his change around. Well, what, he, what he did was he started a, a consultancy. Um, he approached a lot of the, the, the Fortune 500 and said, look, I am notorious as a hacker. And what I want to do is I want to test and test and test your IT security system. So I want you to put me on retainer and I will prevent the hackers from using, I don't know if you could see these, but these are, this is a set of lockpick tools. And you can actually, you can actually twist those things out and those tools actually will pick a lock, which I think is pretty cool. It's so cool that he has on his, uh, on his site, he has a page that has a video showing someone taking those tools out and picking a lock with it. That's so cool. Well, here's what, here's how that relates to what you just asked. If you can draw someone from a device that you handed out as your business card to a page that sets a pixel, well, suddenly you can retarget them and you can run a, a digital persistence campaign. And so I think that's a great expression or use of, of digital media to, to create contact with someone. But um, I, I hope that answered the question. I, I'm, I would say that if you're gonna use email, I'd be really, really brief. Don't write a lot, don't, don't use multiple colors in the, in the copy and don't, you know, like don't, don't make it look like sales copy. Don't make it too long. Um, one, of, one of the people I interviewed for, for my first book for, for how to get a meeting with anyone suggested expressing your message in 12 words or less. And if you do that, and also the timing, is important. If you send it out perhaps early Saturday morning or in or Sunday evening when when I'm assuming you're reaching out to CEOs, but whenever whatever whoever you're reaching out to, you know, they've got their weekend, they're starting up their weekend, but they're checking their email before they start. So that's early Saturday morning. That's the value of that. Or they're checking back in to their they're on their computer again because they're getting ready for the next day. And and either one of those is great timing to send a very, very short email. I've used it and I've gotten through to Steve, um, Steve Forbes that way and Mark Benioff. And these important people will respond if, I guess really what you're showing is you really respect their time. So I hope at least that, that gives you some ideas if it doesn't, or, or if not, if, if it hasn't answered it fully. Yeah, that was fantastic. And yes, if, um, if you have any um, identifying or more specifics that you would like to know, please type in the chat and we can, we can address any remaining um, questions around that answer. So we'll move right now into a live, um, a live question. Cam, I'm going to unmute you. Cam, can you hear us? And would you like to share your voice? Uh, yes. Can you hear me, Stu? Yeah. Hi, Cam. Hi. Um, I really love what you just mentioned because I was planning to contact Mark Benihau um, and I'm <laughs> going to do it this Saturday morning. I've known him. I've met him at Davos. Uh, actually, it was at NASDAQ Pavilion. I met a lot of good people at Davos too. Um, through what you just mentioned, I just want to share it with other people um, who are attending. And this is the first time that I'm talking to a live audience. I'm a little nervous, but through the techniques that Stu, you mentioned, I reached out to CEO and president of Microsoft. I, but of course, that took many years of not contacting them, observing them, but I made a suggestion to them to engage Microsoft as a corporation and they responded. It took two months, but they responded. Well, that's so great. I really, I really like what you just mentioned because I just wanted to mention you, you are a proof example of people are human first, then they are billionaire, then they are CEO. If you absolutely. contact them yeah. as a person, they respond right away. Thank you. Oh, absolutely. Before you go though, what was your campaign? What did you send? How did you approach them? Uh, it was a, it's kind of a, it was a suggestion to bring a business to them and I will get 1% of that business, but the money will not go to me. The money will go to a charity for climate change. So. Nice. nice, nice, nice. Well, thank you for sharing that. That's what, I love to hear these success stories. Um, I was once speaking to a group and I said, does anyone have a, some sort of surefire method for, for breaking through? And I would ask the same question of our group today. Do you have any, any stories of any methods that you use to break through? And someone raised their hand and they said, 
yeah, but you, you're going to think it's kind of silly. And it's no, no, just tell the story. And, um, and he told the story of he, he was in commercial real estate and he wanted to reach this one investor um, and he was trying everything he could think of. Nothing was working. He was sending emails, dropping by, uh, not sending letters. I don't, he was just doing everything he could think of and nothing was working. But he realized the next day or at, at some point, the next day was the fellow's birthday. So he went and got a cupcake uh, at the bakery that morning and put a candle in it, got it in a nice little bakery box and brought it over. And, and the, the receptionist was all ready. She saw him and was all ready to kick him out. But he said, no, no, hold on. It's Bob's birthday today. I just wanted to drop this off. Hands her, hands her this little cute little bakery box. He op she opens it up, sees the cupcake in there. It's kind of a cute little cupcake looking back up with the candle. And she said, that frown turned to a smile really quickly. And she said, hold on a second. Let me see if I can get him. And those, that's a flip moment from a cupcake, a $4 cupcake. And that's the kind of things, I, I just love the fact, Cam, that you, sh that you shared that, that story because there are all kinds of these stories out there and meetings really, the right meetings can change everything. Thank you, Stu, so true. And Cam, thank you so much for jumping on live. Um, let's keep going, we have so many great questions. So from Daniela, how, how would you get a meeting with a banker or someone who can help make a technology purchase for a bank? Technology, well, the first thing I would do is I would use that in Sable uh, by the way, I have no stock <laughs> in Sable, but I, I just think it's fascinating. I would use in Sable to find out which banks might be looking to make the kind of purchase that you, you'd like them to make from you. Um, oh, gosh, I, I, I'm going to go right back to deep personalization pretty quickly, because uh, if, you, if you just do a profile scrape on the bankers that you're looking to reach, I think you'll learn a lot about how to reach them I mean, like what they're interested in, and therefore some sort of thoughtful gift and relevant gift that you could send as a way to introduce yourself. Um, visual metaphors are wonderful. I'm going to pull out the, I'm going to break out the coffee cup again. That's a great visual metaphor. Oops, it's mirrored. That's a great visual metaphor for loss and risk. Because, you know, once the coffee spills, you're not going to, you're not going to, you're going to just clean it up. You're not going to do anything with it. So that's a great metaphor for, um, for risk. You could do the same thing. And I don't, Again, if you, you, you could buy a fake lemon from the same company and, and talk about life, about making lemons from, I'm sorry, lemonade from, from lemons. And you, you just use your imagination a little bit and, and start to think about, well, what is it you want to ex express to them? What is it, what's the core value of the product or service you want to offer? And how does it get expressed in an interesting way in, maybe some sort of physical object. That might be one of the ways I would do it. Um, but I think probably start with just deep personalization. Thank you, Stu. So this is actually, I think, a great follow-up question um, from Sharon. Can you share more about approaches to profile scraping for that deep per personalization? Um, perhaps for those of us who are not so internet tech savvy. <laughs> well. Sure. I mean, the, the, the simplest thing to do, of course, when I mean, it is profile scraping, so you would go to their social media profiles. Um, on LinkedIn, every, almost everybody has a, has a nice shot of themselves, a nice headshot. Um, and you can pull those, you can capture those really easily. Um, <clears throat> and, <clears throat> and in fact, that's what I was showing in these two examples. I don't mean to plug, but, but part of that bottomless box thing is also a there's also a, a, um, um, a course on desktop contact campaigns. So campaigns that you can run from your desktop computer and a laser printer. And so one of the things that I focus on though is taking that, that uh, profile picture and turning it into something. So turning it into a card or a gift, there's all kinds of things you could do with these, with these pictures. And I don't know if it's coming through or if it's just a big moray pattern, but it really does kind of have that appearance of the kind of, um, the kind of illustration that's used a lot in the Wall Street Journal. So I think people would love just that. Um, someone else did a really interesting thing. I know I'm a little off topic for a moment here, but someone did a really interesting thing with profile pictures from LinkedIn. They had bobblehead dolls made and uh, for each of the people that they wanted to connect with at a, at a trade show. So they had, I think about a hundred of these done. And then they sent out emails with a picture of their bobblehead saying, come and stop by our our booth and they got an enormous response to this. So anyway, 
an example of using a profile scrape, but let's get back to how to do it. Um, within within LinkedIn, you could see where people where they where they went to school, and uh, maybe a simple, very simple thing to do would be to to buy a, a, a I don't know a coffee cup or a T-shirt from their alma mater. Um, that's a little kind of easy, um, but you can then of course just dig into more and more of what they're posting, what they're talking about, what they're responding to, and do that not just on LinkedIn, but find them on Twitter and uh, and Facebook perhaps. I mean, we share different things. We tend to share things differently on each of these um, each of these platforms. So it pays to cover all of the platforms. So you can do it manually that way. You can also, of course, do a Google search and find articles that they might have been in and, and read. So, so there are a lot of sources like that. But then there are some shortcuts that I mentioned. Um, one of those you might want to write down is seamless.ai. And another one is uh, is nimble. And both of those will help you. They, they do, they, they prepare dossiers, like what, what people are talking about and, and what, what teams are interested in, that kind of stuff, um, where they are. But I think the most important thing is just getting addresses and maybe more importantly now, because some addresses, I, I'm going to talk about that in a moment. I want to asterisk addresses, but you can get addresses and you can get email addresses and you can get um, phone numbers, which are hard to get otherwise. And, uh, and, but and Sable and, and Nimble both use uh, a layer of AI to do that. that that's pretty helpful. It's, a, it's kind of a force multiplier. Um, and then I would say sort of beyond the profile, I, I mentioned um, Crystal Nose. So that's C-R-Y-S-T-A-L-K-N-O-W-S, crystalnose.com. And, and that will prepare a profile, I mean, a, a personality profile, like a psychological personality profile on the person, which is going way beyond the, the, um, the profile itself. I wanted to asterisk addresses for a moment. We're in the age of COVID. And, um, and so you might think that it's more difficult to get meeting. Well, this is what, this is also, by the way, what passes as meetings these days. We don't, we don't, we're generally, we're not getting, getting into our cars, putting on our masks or jumping on planes, et cetera, to have meetings. We're doing it like this on Zoom. So, and, and people are doing it from home. Um, I'm in my home studio and I, I would imagine that a lot of us are in our home, in our homes right now for this Zoom session. And, uh, and that's where people are. So that's where you meet with them. And so uh, it's, it, it, it's a little bit different. I mean, you, I found that if I was running round tables on a subject, that, and that would, might be an interesting way to, someone asked about FinTech or about selling uh, financial solutions to, to bankers, running a, 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 a Zoom-based round table is a wonderful way to connect with people, but then also to make an offer to them. And if, they, if they'd like to get more information, they'd like to get your book, they'd like to get a, your favorite book or whatever it is, um, they're, they're open to it, they'll give you permission. And if you just ask, well, where do I send it? They'll give you, I've, I've been finding that people are readily giving their home addresses to do that. So that addresses might be a little bit of an issue, but you can get around it. That's wonderful, Stu. We actually had two questions, one from Lauren and one from Michael, specifically asking about working from home. It might be harder to send packages. Um, how would we find their digital content um, or digital contact information, or how might we navigate the physical notes? during this time. So I think that, that answered those questions. And Lauren and Michael, if it didn't, yeah. please just ask for clarification in the chat. That would be great. Um, wonderful, Stu. So let's see. Um, we have so many great questions here um, <laughs> from, let's see. Is, is there a particular method that really registers with salespeople or any stories from them that you like to share? From salespeople? Well, I mean, so the thing is that, <clears throat> that um, usually the audience that I'm speaking to are salespeople, because um, obviously they need to get meetings, <laughs> and and eventually they'll be the ones getting meetings on your behalf for your companies. So, um, I, so salespeople love this, and I mentioned also that that um, you know I wasn't aiming for this. I just wanted to tell this story, and I was using my cartoons and just saying, "Oh my God, this is like a secret weapon." I was getting through to all these people, I've, I've gotten through to presidents and prime ministers and celebrities and so on. There's like all kinds of mischief that ensues from all this stuff. And, and so um, I was gonna say though that, that the, the book be, behind me, this one, 
um, How to Get a Meeting with Anyone, was named one of the top 64 sales books of all time. And that's because getting meetings is so central to the, the mission of selling. You can't, nothing, similarly, nothing happens if, if you can't get meetings. Um, so you asked about a story. I want to share one with you real quickly. It, you know, it's, it's, um, it's, it's, uh, and it's, it's about a startup, late stage startup. So that's good. So when, when, um, when this book came out, when how to get a meeting with anyone came out, I heard from, so I heard from a lot of people, but I heard from this one guy and it just floored me. He, he said, well, listen, listen, um, I want to tell you what happened because I read your book. So a, a year ago, I was just graduating college and I didn't quite know what I wanted to do, but I've been recruited by this late stage startup to be one of their, one of their sales reps. And um, I thought, great, that's fantastic. So um, what he soon discovered though, was that their method was, you're gonna make a hundred phone calls a day. So it's all cold calls, um, but it's just kind of random cold calls. So, but that's what you have to do. That's what we want you to do. Well, one night he was lamenting to a friend over dinner, you know, I, I love the job, I love working with the company, but geez, they're having us make these phone calls and we're not getting any, there are no conversations coming from this. And the friend said, you need to read this book. And he recommended my book. I still don't know who the friend is, I'd like to thank him, but anyway, you need to read this book. And so Dom read the book and he said, oh my God, okay, I know exactly what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna, he decided to use deep personalization. So I'm gonna study some of the people that we, some of us have never even been able to break through to some of these really major potential accounts, but nobody's been able to break through to these people from our team. So I'm going to start applying deep personalization. I'm going to do profile scrapes. I'm going to find out about these people. I'll send a gift that relates directly to them and let's see what happens. So the first one he did, and he's still making his hundred phone calls a day, of course, but the first one he worked on was um, a guy who um, he discovered was really interested in, cooking, family, and technology. So two out of three, he had a, uh, an apron made up. Or, well, he had an apron that he bought and he had it embroidered with a Stanley C. Clark quote, uh, quote, which is, I think is something to the effect that, that technology sufficiently advanced will appear as magic. I think I got it. So that was embroidered on this uh, barbecue apron and he sent it out. The guy responded right away. This is, remember, this is a guy that, that wouldn't respond to anybody in the company, but he responded right away and a six-figure deal ensued. Well, now all of a sudden, the people he's working with are saying, what did you just do? <laughs> Wait a minute. What are you doing that we're not doing? And would you teach us? And he said, sure. Well, this is what I'm doing. So, um, so the first one that he helped, um, they went and they checked. And you know, I, I mentioned Falconry earlier because I had this in mind. So they checked and the guy was really into this, another guy another uh, potential client was really, really interested in falconry. So they went to a falconry site, asked the owner, what do we get for someone who's really interested in falconry as a, as a gift? And he said, you want to get him a, this glove? He pointed out the glove. You know, they always have this big ornate glove that they use. And so they ordered the glove. They also downloaded the picture and ordered the glove. It was, it was ordered to be sent to directly to the prospect. Meanwhile, they took that downloaded picture, included it in an email and said, I'm sending you this, this glove. I uh, hope you enjoy it. I know you're into falconry. And by the way, I'm sending it because I'd just like to have a few minutes with you on the phone. He, again, this is someone that no one had been able to break through to. Well, within like 30 seconds, they got a response and to, to the email. And he said, that's so cool. Thank you very much. But look, the problem is I'm not a prospect for what you sell. So good luck and thank you. Then the glove arrives and he, he gets back in touch and he says, oh my God, I got the glove. I love it. And, and you know, thank you so very, very much. And listen, remember I told you I wasn't a prospect for what you sell? Well, I'm, I'm not, but I know of three CIOs who are. So I'm going to make introductions because he was just so thrilled with the glove. <laughs> Made introductions, more six-figure deals ensued. And pretty, pretty soon, management was saying, what's going on now? What's going on in the... I, 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 don't, I hate to call it a sweat job, but you know, if they're making 100 phone calls a day, <laughs> that's... You know, they're working hard. So what's going on down there? What are, you, what are you guys doing? What just happened? What changed? And they all pointed to Dom and said, well, he's, he's been teaching us how to use this form of personalization and we're all breaking through. Well, Dom was promoted to sales manager of the company. And then the company was acquired by Cisco for I think $4.7 billion. So within the span of a year, using contact marketing, 
Tom went from a new college graduate to the sales manager of a multi-billion dollar multinational um, company. So that it works for sales. I mean, that's, salespeople are using this all the time. Dude, what an incredible story. Thank you for sharing. And I know right now we're actually at time. So for some closing remarks, Stu, we are so grateful that you've taken the time. You're an incredible author um, to speak to our community, to share your insights, to set such a great overview and to give such specific and detailed examples on how to move forward. So on behalf of the NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center and everyone in attendance today, we are sincerely grateful. Thank you so much for joining us. I, I, I'm so glad to be offering this, this knowledge up to your, to your base. I, I, what, a, what a pleasure to join you. Thank you so much, Stu. And for everyone that's still listening in, we have a few amazing webinars and town halls coming up. Next Tuesday, Master Economic Recovery, Predictive Models and Forecasts. Uh, we also have next Thursday, Building the Muscle of Resilience. And the following Wednesday, um, a Founders Leadership, Leadership Series with Janice Bryant Howard of the Act One Group. Um, so we have some incredible webinars coming up. Please join us. You will receive um, as a follow-up Stu's contact information if you didn't catch it in the chat and a few other things specifically from Stu, like he mentioned the incredible gift that he is so happy to share with you all. And on behalf again of, Entrepreneurial, of NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center and uh, all of us here right now, thank you again, Stu. Uh, we hope everyone has a fantastic afternoon. Bye now.